Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today, we're looking at the smallest meaningful parts of language and how we learn them. But first, we had a great time at Winter Slash Summer Conference Fest 2017 Slash 18. That's a lot of slashes. Uh, we had so much fun seeing people in their Lingthusiasm International Phonetic Alphabet scarves and their other Lingthusiasm merch. And please keep sending in your pictures. We're going to make a collage of everybody with uh, Lingthusiasm stuff. And it was so fun to see you all in Meet Space. I was only at the, the LSA in Utah. Uh, Lauren was at both the LSA in Utah and the ALS, the Australian Linguistic Society in, where was it, Lauren? So Gretchen and I got to hang out at the Linguistic Society of America annual conference in Salt Lake City in Utah, along with a few thousand other linguists. And it was amazing. It was my first time I've ever been to an LSA. Um, But before that, in December, I was at the Australian Linguistic Society conference, um, hence the winter slash summer 2017 slash 18 conference fest. And it was so great to see everyone and to see so many people wearing uh, IPA scarves. It just made me so happy. Um, while I was at ALS, I had the chance to chat with Daniel Midgley from Talks to Talk about the workshop we did on popularizing linguistics. And that is going to be part of our Patreon bonus episode this month. I am really excited to listen to that recording because I haven't heard it yet. Great Patreon news. 2018, we have full length episodes for every bonus episode. So you are getting more bonus bang for your Patreon buck with those. Yeah, so full episodes there. And you guys have been so amazing at supporting us on Patreon that we have to set some new goals. What a hardship. Just kidding, we're very excited. So we have set a new goal to commission some Lingthusiasm art. We're really excited that we get to support an artist and have some cool art of the show. I am really excited for this goal. That is our new $1,200 goal. Uh, We still have the live show to aspire to as well. And we are already plotting all kinds of other exciting future Patreon shenanigans. We bumped the live show up to 16 just because uh, we want to have a bit more time to plan that and make it go really well. And we had a mini live show in September already. So we wanted to space out the live shows a bit, get the art in sooner because people have been so keen about the merch. We want to have more art type options for that. And yeah, we're really excited. big question in linguistics is how do babies learn words and how do they learn the pieces of words and the way that we put words together to make them into longer sentences and compound words. And we talked a bit about how babies learn sounds back in a previous episode, but the word part, it has been a longstanding puzzle. And one of the options that people talked about early in the days of figuring out how how babies learn words is maybe they memorize them. Maybe they hear the adults say the words and they say, aha, this must be a word that I'm trying to learn. And so they just memorize them, kind of like whatever the adults come out with, the baby just learns. They are just a word vacuum. You know, it's just like a little, you know, those little penguins in the the Skinner boxes, like you you give them the stimuli and it presses the button, it presses the button, it presses the stimuli. Maybe babies just learn words like little penguins in boxes pressing buttons. Did you say the penguins in the Skinner machines? I meant pigeons. I meant pigeons. They are definitely pigeons. But you could probably do it with penguins. Penguins are pretty smart. Okay, I'm just gonna (laughs) just gonna keep going dig myself out of this. Okay. Uh, So maybe they're like the pigeons in the Skinner boxes. Um, And one way to test this uh, to say, okay, our baby's actually just learning words by memorizing what their parents say, is you give them some novel words, and you see what they do. So we have a picture uh, on the website. You can see it as I'm presenting this picture to Gretchen. And I'm presenting her with a thing she has never seen before. And I say, Gretchen, this is called a wug. Okay. It's a cute little blue boopy bird-like thing. And I have this this one wug here. We also have to pretend that I'm about three years old. So just just for perspective. Yes. Okay. Um, And then if I present you with an illustration that has two of these little blue things. We have two... Wugs? You are as capable as a three-year-old. Congratulations. Oh, yay! 
Woo! You have passed what is known as the Wug test. So the Wug test was a test that was created in I think it's 1958 by Jean Berko Gleason, who was actually an undergrad at the time. So amazing, which kind of makes me feel inadequate about my entire life, my life choices. Yeah. <laughs> so she was an undergrad、uh, in linguistics and psychology or something, and she、um, created this Wug test, and she created these drawings of these novel creatures that kids had never encountered before. And she elicited from the kids the plural forms of these words they'd never seen before. And the point of this is to point out: well, if I memorized, you know, I learned the word cat from my parents, and I could also learn the word cats from my parents. We don't know that I haven't just memorized cat and cats and dog and dogs and so on. Like an overactive word vacuum.、Uh, like a word vacuum. But if you give me a word I've never seen before, and I'm suddenly able to make the plural without anyone telling me what the plural is, using the same kind of patterns that are involved in、uh, other English plurals, then I must be doing something else. I must be generalizing beyond just you know language in, language out. So we have something that looks like there are some rules there. Yeah, we have some rules there, and you know, kids can look at the parts of the words, not just you know the whole words. And intuitively, this makes a lot of sense because kids also do this thing where they take a word that in English has an irregular plural or has an irregular past tense, and they'll regularize it. They'll make it fit the patterns of the rest of the language. So kids will say things like "taked" instead of "took," right, or "sawed" or "goed." Instead of seen or、uh, went, what's really great is you often get what's known as the like regularization curve is、mm. the like fancy linguist term for it, where a child will say like I ran, and you're like,、oh, good work, kid, you are doing the past tense great, you are so good, and then they start saying I runned, and it's because they've learnt that there is this rule that they should be applying, and they over apply it to all of them, including the irregular ones, and you're like, oh no, I broke the kid, it was doing so well. <laughs> <laughs> and then they eventually go back to figuring out the irregular forms. But there's this like it looks like a dip in their ability to speak, but it's actually a really important phase because they're figuring out what the rules are and they are applying them. Yeah, and so definitely kids do do some memorization. Like you can't just learn a bunch of words without memorizing some stuff. But they're also trying to make the words into a system, and that's something that's that's really interesting. And in fact, what they're learning in things like the Wug test is even more subtle than that. So、uh, I said, "There's two wugs,、uh, Lauren. If I gave you another drawing, let's say this is like a, you know, red fluffy ballo thing animal,、um, yeah. And I say,、uh, this is a blick. Okay. Now there are two of them. Yeah. There are two blicks. Blicks. So we have two wugs, but two blicks. Yep. So the kid has figured out. That they have to add a thing to the word to make it plural, to make it more than one. So that's great, and it's also figured out something else. Yeah, but it's actually really hard to think about this because we do it all the time. But we're actually doing something super clever here. So I'm going to say we're going to go for like super slow mo action replay,、mm -hmm. and I'm going to say blicks and wugs really slowly. So we have wugs and we have blicks. But Lauren, why didn't we end up with wugs and blicks? I can't even do that. That's really hard. <laughs> It's really hard, and that's because even though we have this one thing that we think of as the plural s, the plural s actually takes on a bunch of different kind of costumes depending on who it's hanging out with. And so a g in the wugs is a, what we call a voiced sound. So you've got that. Movement at the kind of bottom of your throat. You're vibrating, vibrating your vocal cords or vocal fold, and so you got a g g g, and that goes with a z g z. And then for blicks, you've got this k k k. You don't have that vibration in your throat anymore. I still have to like automatically put my hand to my throat when I talk about this. It's such an automatic reaction. I, I've got my hand on my throat right now, and I think we should tell all the listeners this is the play along portion、uh, of the podcast. Uh, you need to put、yeah. your hand on your throat. It doesn't matter if you're on public transport; just put your hand on your throat. I don't care. I've, I've been told that some people have laughed out loud at this podcast before. If you can laugh、yeah. out loud, you can zzz out loud. <laughs> Maybe not. You should do it anyway.、Um, put your hand on your throat <laughs> and make the zzz sound. Zzz versus zzz, and you can feel they're different. That's because the plural part has. 
different shapes that it puts on depending on what it's near because then it's easier to say because we are nothing if not motivated by laziness. It's efficiency. It's definitely efficiency. And so yeah. if you have a bit of a difficult time, you can also try saying blix and blix, blig, ugh, I can't even. Blix. Blix. Because you might end up saying bligs, which is fine. <laughs> Because that's just yeah. as easy. Again, it's just everyone hanging out. Yeah. And then try saying wugs and wugs. Wugs. But not wux. Wux is different. <laughs> that's another non-fictional, non-existent creature. That's another, that's that's wugs cousin. Um, yeah. So we do this thing and we also do it with English words. So if you have a word like dogs, you're going to say it like wugs with the z sound. Compared to something like cats. So they're the two forms that we think of the most, but the plural actually has a third costume that it puts on sometimes in the context of a word like fox. So if you think about the plural of fox, you have one fox and two foxes. Congratulations, Gretchen. Good work. Yes, good. I'm, I'm, I don't know why I had a question intonation of my voice there. I, I know what the plural of fox is. So sometimes you, your linguist intuitions just get in the way. The problem is if you do this test on adults who are linguists, they'll be like, oh, it's foxin. It's fox eye. And you're like, no, no, really, I, I just want the, the kid answer. Like, don't, don't mess with me here. Anyway, the point is, even though we have the one thing that we think of as the bit that gets added to make a plural, it actually interacts with that sound system that we talked about in an earlier episode on child language to create these different forms. And we can see this if we do another variation on the WUG test. So let's say I have I now have this purple kind of domey thing. Yeah. And this is a cash. And now I've got two of them. Yeah. There are two cashes. Cashes. So you definitely can't have two cashes. Cashes. Because that's it's just too cash. much to no, trip over. You need that vowel in there to separate out the je from the s. Just not a thing. Yeah. And Jean Burke Gleason is often cited as being, okay, well, she's the wug person. But she did this whole range of tests with people. And she had words like wug that end in a g, where you expect the kids to say z for the plural. And words like blick that end in a k, where you expect the kids to say s for the plural. And she also had words like cash that end in a sound that's like too close to a s or a z sound to just stick one on as a plural directly. And so you need that extra vowel, cages, fishes, foxes. So this isn't just learning words and their automatic plural, because kids have never seen these words when they do this test. Yeah, it's sensitivity to like three different things about English plurals. And it turns out kids are pretty good at the wug blick thing. And it takes them another, like, six months to a year or so to get the cash thing. Right. So when they're really young, they'll say wugs right, and then they'll just say cash as if it's also the plural form. And then, like, a year later, you bring them in again, or you bring in slightly older kids, and they've got it. They've, like, figured out this extra one. But it does take them a little bit longer. So you can kind of watch this acquisition happening in real time. You don't just get, like, magic, you know all about the plural now. Go forth and pluralize. It's an additive process. Yeah, it, it really happens yeah. in stages. Have you ever run a WUG test? Because I, I mean, I teach this all the time, but I, I've never run an experiment using it. I did, actually. So I was a research assistant the summer between my second and third years of university. And I had taken a class with this prof who was a developmental psycholinguistics, actually in the psychology department, but the linguistics department was pretty small. So I was like, oh, this, this is a good class. Let me just approach this prof and say, hi, <laughs> could you use a research assistant for the summer and you'd like to pay me for it maybe? Okay. Um, what can I work on? Um, and so we, you know, applied for this grant and I got this like summer research grant to, to work on this project. And we were trying to do a modified WUG test thing where we were trying to figure out how to teach kids irregular plurals. Right. So if you have like foot, feet, like, can I teach them cut, keet or something like this? And so, uh, spoiler alert, it didn't work. Huh, interesting. And like, I'm not sure why it didn't work. It could have been like, we messed up. It could have been like... The words were too hard. We could have, maybe we had to like give them more exposures because like yeah. maybe you have to be exposed to an irregular plural like four or five times uh, or 20 times. It's, a, it's one of those things. I think it's worth pointing out that like sometimes a failure just gives you an idea of how you might have gone wrong and that provides some insight as well. Yeah. So there's like 20 different ways that we might have gone wrong. Yes. Um, and I don't know what they are. And like, maybe it's just not possible. But like, we know kids learn irregular somehow. 
But anyway, yeah, so so we just don't know. But it was a fun it was a fun summer. I got to go to the dollar store and buy a bunch of toys because we instead of doing drawings, we did like actual toys. I love experiment crafting. So much fun. It's so much fun. So I went to the dollar store, I bought a bunch of cheap toys, and then I like took them apart and put them back together to make like Franken toys. <laughs> So there were things the kids had never seen before. Because they had to be things the kids yeah. had never seen before. And the ethics board, so we had to fill out an ethics application. They were very concerned that we not do it with like objects the kids might have seen because they didn't want us to confuse the kids by teaching them the wrong words right. for things because that's like not ethical. Right. Okay. Because sometimes, yeah, people do these experiments and like show the kids a garlic press and it's like, oh, kids are probably don't know what a garlic press is. We'll just give it a weird name. But we were like, no, we have to make like unique toys. Anyway, so it didn't work. It was a very interesting summer. But in the way we can pull apart small animals and toys to make other animals and toys, we can pull apart words. Like, we often think of words as these, like, individual units of meaning that have a particular importance. But words have meaningful bits within them. Exactly. And the field of linguistics that looks at, you know, what are the meaningful bits of words and how, what's the kind of the smallest correspondence that you can have between a sound and a meaning... Yeah. Because, you know, some words are really long and they have lots of, of individual parts of them that have individual meanings that get added to them. You know, cats has two parts of meaning to it. It has the cat part and it has that s at the end that's adding this plural meaning. And so linguists talk about morphemes as these individual units of meaning, combined meaning and sound. So a cat is a word that's a single morpheme. Cats is a word that has two morphemes. Yeah. And you can get up to like very, very long words that have lots of morphemes. Yeah. And different languages have different preferences for how many morphemes that they have. Yeah. And so you can get some of these like fake English examples, like anti disestablishmentarianism has a lot of morphemes in English, these kinds of fun words. Yeah. So one language that's, that's well known for having very long words is Turkish, uh -huh. which has lots of different inflectional things that you can add on to words and just kind of string them together. Um, some of which have been translated into a full sentence. Turkish is one that I can vouch for because I had an intro linguistics prof who was Turkish and she used to give us this example. So I believe her and I think it's, I think it's real. Uh, I tried to verify it on the internet, but you know, and uh, this is a long word that means are you one of those people who we could not make to be European or we could not Europeanize? So here you're getting the kind of meaning that takes a whole English sentence and many words all fitting together using parts of a single word. Right. So you have one part that makes it a question. You have one part that means one of. You have one part that means not. You have one part that means could, uh, you know. And the example that I found, the equivalent that I found of it on the internet is, are you one of those people who we could not make to be Czechoslovakian? Which I think is probably just because Czechoslovakian is very long. Um, so it probably beats... So it looks more impressive. <laughs> it looks very impressive. Uh, I think, you know, European has is also fairly long, but not quite as long as Czechoslovakian. So someone really went for the... But it has the same number of morphemes, probably. The word that I learned in my... Because people always like to have one example in their intro to linguistics courses. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm in Australia, and Australian languages are really well known for having lots of really rich kind of affixing to words. So you have a word that is the whole sentence. And so the one I had is from a language called uh, Binigunwak or Mayali, and it translates as... I cooked the wrong meat for them again. So again, something that takes a whole sentence in English to say can be said in just one word that has lots of these affixes. Yeah. So prefixes and suffixes are all kinds of morphemes, but an individual word itself that has nothing else onto it is also a morpheme. Um, and sometimes it's hard, like something that's a prefix or a suffix in one language might just be an individual short word in another. Yeah. Uh, and, but both of those are morphemes. So it's, it's useful to have a cover term for this entire category that doesn't commit to whether a language treats something like negation, not, as uh, an added morpheme or as a separate word. You know, like English, English has both. Like we can say not as a separate word. We can say ain't as in didn't, which is kind of a suffix, kind of a word, or we can treat it as a as an affix. You can say something like un at the beginning of a word, and that's that's negation as an affix. So there's, you know, there's lots of different ways of expressing that, and there's ways of doing that. And one of the kind of fun rites of passage in doing intralinguistics is the morphology problem set. 
I love morphology. Morphology problems to me are like, they're like Sudoku for linguists. They so much are. Like, I find them so soothing and I get to crack out all my coloured pens. We have an example that we'll link to in the show notes to an International Linguistics Olympiad problem from 2003 on a language called Artiga. And you can just see, looking at it immediately, there's seven sentences, and each sentence has three words in Artiga and, like, five, six, seven words in the English translation. And you just, like, instantly, your little linguist spider senses kind of go, ooh, that means each of those words has more units that have meaning in them and more meaningful different bits than the English ones do. And I'm going to figure out what they are. Yeah, and so you're looking at the sentence and say, okay, so what do the English ones have in common and what's there in the Adiga versions and what's, you know, it's it's so much fun. I, I enjoy them so much. You know, this is one of the things that, like, if you think you want to become a linguist, you can go hit up the International Linguistics Olympiad uh, and check out some of their problem sets because they, they do a lot that are kind of this logic language-based morphology problem set. They're a lot of fun. Um, and in, I was very disappointed to learn in, in real life <laughs> in you know, when you're when you're actually dealing with a language that's uh, more in a in a more naturalistic setting, and you're not just given the language on a page, it gets a lot more complicated very quickly. Yeah, it, not disappointed, but it, it's disappointing and exciting at the same time because you're like, well, I figured out that this thing must be a morpheme, but what I haven't figured out is exactly what it means because it seems to mean this thing in this circumstance, and this thing in this other circumstance, and this thing over here. Or I figured out that there's something going on here, but I'm not sure if it's actually two morphemes or if it's three morphemes or if it's just one (laughs) or like, you know, both of these words end in S, but are they both the same S morpheme? Because there's lots of words in English that end in S that aren't plural. Yep. Some of them are the, like, the verb form for third person singular. Yeah. So he eats, she runs. Yeah. So, like, those are two different S's. Those are two different yeah. morphemes in English. There's a plural morpheme and there's a third person singular morpheme. And those aren't the same thing. But if you were approaching English from this perspective of, like, we've got to figure it out, you'd probably spend some time being like, well, hmm, maybe there's something that they have in common. Maybe they're historically related. Do, are we, do we think these are the same? <laughs> These are indeed the the kind of thoughts that we tend to go on. Yeah, morphology problem sets are kind of like the spherical cows of linguistics. Like in physics, you get to assume that there's no friction and gravity is always at this speed and the wind isn't blowing. And you're like, ah, oh, the cow just falls. It's approximately a sphere shape. Uh, and so they're, they're this, this fun abstraction to look at, but they're also just a very beginning taste of the complexity that's actually there in a language. Yeah, and it is a set that someone has deliberately set out for you so they know exactly how challenging it is and that it can be solved in some way. And then you get to real language and you're like, oh, it's it's a lot more complicated when people actually use it. (laughs) But I feel like I've, like, when I started linguistics, I had this idea that like there were words that had meaning and that's your semantics taken care of. Um, you have the order that words are put in and that's syntax and words are made up of particular sounds or hand shapes and that's your phonetics or your articulatory stuff taken care of. And I don't really think like morphology is kind of the, the quiet middle child of linguistics. Yeah, sometimes it kind of gets lost between phonology and syntax. I mean, some people will say that you know, syntax and morphology are really just kind of different sides of the same coin because a lot of things that are a single word in one language are a, a, a prefix or a suffix in another language. And so if we primarily look at morphology when it's like stuff glommed on to other stuff, then we end up ignoring the languages where you can separate them out. But as we've seen with the ways that you have the different plural morphemes, like there is something different that morphology is doing there at least. So one quote about that is today's morphology is yesterday's syntax or today's syntax is yesterday's morphology. And this is a quote by Tom Givon that gets kind of quoted in linguistics, but it comes in this idea from a linguist named R.M.W. Dixon. And he talks about languages evolving in a cycle from having, you know, a lot of individual words to kind of glomming those words onto each other a little bit, to having these long words with lots of bits glommed on, and then keep going around. So you can put languages with lots of bits glommed on at 12 o'clock on a clock, you can put the languages with lots of individual words at four o'clock, and you can put the languages where like 
the individual bits have started to stick together again at eight o'clock. So he says that old Chinese was around three o'clock, mostly individual words with some little bits of fusion. <laughs> and modern varieties are at five o'clock instead. So now they're heading towards glomming on in the other direction. I would love if this was just the default way of talking about morphology. It's like, yeah, I'm working on an 11 o'clock language. It's pretty exciting. <laughs> it's, it's kind of interesting to see in English because so Old English has lots of words with lots of endings and stuff. So it would probably it would be up at 12 o'clock. Yeah. And then English starts losing uh, most of those endings. You know, it's like it loses a, loses a lot of endings. It loses a lot of, of these inflections. You know, we, or we're left with just like, instead of having, you know, different endings for I go and you go and he or she goes yeah. and, and so on. There's just this one left that goes. So English has lost most of those. But now we're getting more added on because you have stuff like ain't as in didn't or won't. And that used to be a separate word, and now it's glomming on instead. Yeah. Or you have like the uh, as in coulda, woulda, shoulda. Like that was a separate word, and now it's glommed on in informal speech. So we're moving moving around the clock once more. I think we're like at six o'clock now. I think we're moving back around the other direction. And we do kind of, we don't make new morphemes as often as we make new words, but it is something that we can do in a language. So I have a friend who likes to track a few of them, and she sent me a little while ago down a spiration rabbit hole. Mm. So kind of inspiration, the, the meaning behind inspiration gets captured by the spiration suffix that you can add to things like lingspiration is when you're inspired by something in linguistics. Oh, we could have called the podcast that, Lauren. We could have. It would have been really great. Well, I mean, enthusiasm is a is not a bad candidate enthusiasm for a kind of one. new productive morphine. Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah. I mean, Ling is Ling is definitely there in like the names of a lot of linguistic stuff. Yes. <laughs> I know an undergraduate linguistic society that calls themselves the Underlings. Oh, that's great. I like that. Pretty cute. Yeah, uh, and you get stuff like um, like holic, uh, which starts out as alcoholic and becomes stuff like shopaholic and chocoholic. Yeah. And these kinds of things. You also have sometimes um, morphemes break free, and it makes me so happy when they do this. Uh, one thing I know you've talked about in a old blog post, and I think I've written about it for the big issue as well, is the liberation of ish. So ish is a really, like, it's a good, robust Germanic suffix that used to just refer to, like, people of a particular place, like English or Danish, mm. and then came to refer to an attribute of something. So and now, now you get, like, bluish and tallish. Yeah. And now you can kind of say, you know, um, does that taste good? And you can kind of be like, uh, ish. And it kind of is like an approximate, like, oh, kind of. Yeah. Hungry. Yeah. Ish. Completely tangential, but still great ish fact. It is cousins with the French esque. Oh, is it? Yeah, French oh, neat. borrowed. So you can borrow morphemes across languages in the way you can borrow words. Yeah. It doesn't happen as often. Well, English borrowed esque from French, for that matter. Yes. So we borrowed esque, but it was the French borrowed it from Germanic languages a bit earlier and then used it in their own way. So huh. you can do a lot of things with morphemes that you can do with words, like borrow them. And have them change over time. And yeah, and in some sense, like, you know, a language in the languages with a written tradition, you know, is there spaces between it is kind of the definition of a word. But, you know, the question of, like, should there be spaces here is, is still an open question for at least certain uh, members of, of the vocabulary. Um, so, you know, questions like, should you close something up? You know, like in, initial, just because I've been doing a lot of researching about the early internet these days, people were writing web site with a space between it for a while. And now, Aww. I know, <laughs> it's so cute. And now people pretty standardly write websites. Come visit my website. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the site that I have on the web. My it's web my pages website. on my website. <laughs> my web mail. So you can, you can see how things like intonation are really important here for spoken language rather than written language. The intonation comes first. Obviously, people were saying website before they started dropping the space as much. So speaking of new words, wugs are actually kind of useless as a fake word now because they've become such a recognized category in linguistics. Like, because they're so very cute, and if you haven't seen a picture of a wug, you should definitely look one up. It's spelled W-U-G. Um, because they're so cute and they're so friendly looking, they've become kind of a mascot of linguistics. And so... They are definitely a linguist meme. They're definitely a linguist meme. 
So you get people, um, I keep a whole file on the blog just of like fun stuff people have done with wugs. There are knitted wugs, there are crocheted wugs, there are wug cookies, there are wugs on mugs, which I think is particularly <laughs> great. <laughs> that is very good. <laughs> um, there are the University of Edinburgh Undergraduate Linguistic Society, and I met some of their members uh, last year or the year before when I went out to visit them, and uh, they have full human-sized WUG costumes. What? No. Oh my gosh, yes, and they did that WUG battle. Yes, and they have a video of them wearing the WUG costumes and the WUGs, mm. the two WUGs, it, people in the WUG costumes, like, fake battling each other. And here is a WUG, here are two WUGs. The students told me that they wear them for recruitment. Like, they have a little <laughs> booth on, like, the when the students are arriving. And they say, come join yeah. our society. We're really friendly. And also we're wearing these giant, ridiculous costumes. <laughs> That is so great. Um, we have all the usual um, related links for the episode, and then we have a whole different subsection of WUG links for your amusement, or just check out Gretchen's WUG's tag on all things linguistic. I really enjoy collecting all of the possible WUGs. People have had made WUG tattoos. Uh, I'm in a linguistics meme group on Facebook, and um, every couple days somebody will post, like, can someone explain to me this WUG meme because I missed it? And people will have to be like, no, 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 it's it's not actually a meme, it's this linguistics thing. Like, here you go. So this has been your introduction to morphology and the very important linguist WUG meme. Pop culture references. <laughs> Yeah, so you get you get an important theoretical concept and also the most important linguistics meme. <laughs> more enthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, including an abundance of WUGs, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistic questions, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Current bonus topics include the semantics of sandwiches, language games, how to teach yourself linguistics, and a talk about linguistics in the public sphere with Daniel Migley of the Talk the Talk podcast. And you could help us pick the next topic by becoming a patron. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay too. We also really appreciate it if you can rate us on iTunes or recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Feel free to also send us your photos of any Lingthusiasm merch that you've gotten. We would love to see it uh, in your life with you. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our audio producer is Claire and our editorial producer is Emily. Our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!